everyone and welcome back to Southern Deadly Yarns. I'm Eve from Onkapringa Libraries and this is Elijah from Neparendi Aboriginal Forum. Um, we are super excited to be joined by the author of Fire Country, uh, Victor Stephenson. So Victor is an expert in the revival of um, cultural burning practices um, and his book came out just after the devastating bushfires of 2020. Uh, thank you, Eve. And yeah, hello to everybody out there. My name's Elijah. I'm from Neparendi. I'm an Aravana person. Um, today we're here on the lands of the Ghana people and it's important that we acknowledge them and their continuing spiritual connection to country. Um, and we do want to create a bit of a safe space here online. So if people, you know, want to give a shout out as to whose country you're on, where you're from, that kind of thing, feel free to do so. And um, yeah, be yeah respectful to one another. And if you've got any questions, send them through and other people might want to react to them and yeah see if we can create a nice online safe space and um i, I guess for me as an arabata person fire is wow you, you you almost tend to think of it as like a spiritual being it's um something that's yeah i wish i could explain it a little more better than that but i don't know what 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 does fire mean to you victor oh yeah g'day everyone out there um, well, fire, well, it's life, you know, and it's a um, big part of culture and it's shaped as landscape and it's shaped the way people live with the land as well. And um, it also represents that people are a part of the landscape and, you know, and it's such a spiritual thing and it's, it's an amazing, amazing, you know, element and natural phenomenon you know that fire is just it's just an incredible thing and and it just it's more than what people think you know it's entrenched into so much of our lives and and so much that people don't realize you know yeah, uh, it's yeah. part of managing the land it's um, keeping us warm we use it to cook it's it's just a, such an incredible thing and and um and if we're not friends with the fire then you know then it can be the total opposite you know <laughs> yeah and I, and I guess that does go to some points some people that are familiar with it treasure it see it as yeah something up almost out of this world um but then again there's that juxtapositioning to why people fear it and i guess when you do see some of those big raging fires it's easy to slip into that sense of our oh, fear and you know this, this idea of fire being no good. Um, do, do you find that when you're trying to explain the benefits of fire to the landscape that some people are just in some sort of fear mode and they just don't understand what you're trying to do? Oh well, that's the that's the that's the norm, you know, of social, you know, of Australia, you know, and you're not not particularly for Indigenous people, obviously, but but for the general Australian public, they're frightened. And fear is a big part of their baseline when it comes to understanding the environment, when it comes to everything, really. It's all about fear. And so, you know, fire is something that the people fear and simply because they've disconnected themselves from it so much and from the country that they've um, ignored it. And, and, um, and as a result, um, they get the, the bad end of the stick. And so we live in a whole society that's frightened and scared of fire and and is totally disconnected from our landscapes and you know and it's um it's it's really concerning and and um you know like even our professionals in fire in this country you know they they're not at that level of of how old people were connected to the land and how they understood fire and work with fire on the landscape so this is a real problem that people are so disconnected from landscapes and, uh, and have such a fear of fire and that gets in the way of putting in the right fire. Um, and it's not just fear of the fire, it's fear of Aboriginal involvement too. It's a fear um, that people are going to lose their jobs if Aboriginal people get involved and it's an egotistic thing as well. And it's just, it really is a battle to um you know when you're looking at something like fire because it's about changing the culture of this country 
you know and that's a big big thing a big step and a large corner to turn and there's a lot of obstacles and you know that um you know that that need to be you know dealt with um in dealing with this and but you know there's hope and um you know we just got to keep on going keep doing the work and i'm not just talking about myself i'm talking about you know the whole nation as a collective and all the communities involved and whether they're working together or not to um, defeat um, that colonized mindset. It's a real problem. And I think if we could go back 250 years and um, if the non-Indigenous people could see down the track, you know, I'm sure they would be aware of um, the dilemma that um, we're in, you know, down into the future with um, being neglected from the truth within landscapes and that real connection with country and and the intelligence that one of the oldest cultures in the world um, has for our future. Wow. You clearly hold um, so much knowledge, Victor, and anybody who's familiar with your story would know that you got a lot of that knowledge from some old fellas, Uncle Tommy and Uncle George, um, up in Laura in Queensland. Did you always want to take that knowledge and put it into book form to share with um, non-Indigenous and Indigenous Australia? Nah, <laughs> we had no idea. And like, I had no idea that we'd be going around teaching people. And to tell you the truth, um, I had we had no, really no idea that people didn't know anything about, you know, that knowledge, you know, not many people knew of that knowledge. It was very scarce and people do know, of course, but the, majority of Australia and yeah like you know we knew that there was problems in the southern parts of Australia um, where people um, we see it on the news of people um, getting burnt and houses getting burnt down and wildfires happening and we're getting the same wildfires up the north too um, and I see remember seeing the old people you know looking at large fire clouds in the distance where, you know, certain people were burning in the wrong way and they'd be all concerned and, you know, there's a major wildfire out there, but no one would really hear about it. But when we started doing the work, but I had no idea that we'd be doing this. But as we started to get going and people from different parts of the country started to come to the homelands of the Mulfollers and up in the northern Australia area um, to experience the workshops and and learn a little bit more on the subject it just started snowballing from there and i had no idea <laughs> and so riding fire country was was something that came later when i started to see just how much of our work was being received and how much of the knowledge was being received and so i started to see well you know it's too late now we've got to keep going we've already started to do this work and we need to finish this work and so writing fire country was you know was something i thought well i need to write all this down so people know what the story they know where um how you know our work started at least and they also um, knew where the knowledge um came from with the mole followers as well and 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 how that knowledge has progressed as well with you know traveling around the country and um, you know myself as well and and further um, developing that those concepts and knowledge and broadening those um, concepts and, and that's why I wanted to write fire country was so people could see the truth and where they were how it all happened um, acknowledge them all people first and foremost you know and have them their story told which I you know I really I was just that was just a pleasure writing for them old people and writing about our experiences together. And also writing Fire Country was to was to also save that knowledge and protect it in a way so that people, you know, could see that it's already published, uh, you know, that all those indicators and knowledge and stories. And, um, and the final part of that is so that people could understand the big picture and what fire really means and and that it's more than fire and it's about the, the whole country it's about ourselves it's about our social structures it's about everything and um 
we can't heal landscapes if if people don't know the, the big picture and don't understand it um you know on what's involved and what are the things that are stopping you know such positive change and you know what are the um and how can people contribute and how do feel, people feel a part of that and i guess that's why i wanted to write fire country was all those reasons you know yeah i think you've done a good job yeah it, it makes for a great read Definitely. and you can almost yeah well i've never read a book you know i don't really read you know i mean you know when i come to the english i fail english and like and all those subjects and you know and i've never never have time to read because i'm always out on country and you know, i'm always reading landscapes and and you know, I spend a lot of my time in my earlier lives and, you know, I always spend a lot of time listening, you know, listening to people with knowledge and stories and the old people and whatever. But books, that was something outside of um, my ability. But then I started to realise that uh, writing is storytelling. And, you know, always, always would say, and they always hear Aboriginal people say, oh, no, we don't want to write it in books. We don't write things down in books. But storytelling, we do all the time. And I found that writing in story form, just the way I talk and and how I would just tell a story around a fire was how I read, just read it. And, and that became easy for me. Um, and it also was a blessing to have publishers like Hardy Grant that... Um, were able to let me allow me to tell my story my way and not make it difficult for me and give me a hard time about punctuation or whatever or what words I use or that it did stop me from using certain words <laughs> um, when it came to some real situations there you know um, some of those stories were pretty intense but at the end of the day um, yeah storytelling and I just I think for Aboriginal people you know, I guess from my experiences, I just wanted to let them all know that um, writing is storytelling and you can write a book um, and don't be frightened of that because it's just storytelling and just say how it is and write it down. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's quite amazing. And it's amazing what you can react and solicit from a book and, you know, you can just pull out people's emotions and, and thoughts. It's, it's, yeah, quite amazing. Yeah, um, it's a beautiful thing to just to be able to be that you know that artistic sort of feel to it as well and that real poetic sort of feel and because all those sort of forms of writing really tying with emotion and really work well with um aboriginal storytelling and storytelling in general you know and when we're talking about the landscape and we're talking about our elders and we're talking about like uh you know that knowledge you know we they're so precious all those things i just mentioned are precious and so it deserves justice when you when you talk about that whether you're talking it or whether you're writing it or whether you're painting it um it really needs justice and it it really deserves um a profound beauty and i think that's what makes it so well received as well you know yeah yeah see I, I think yeah yeah writing books owning it owning those stories yeah. and there's probably an element of look intellectual property there that needs to be owned too by Aboriginal people rather than just other people writing our stories for us and then taking them away and, and owning them so yeah no, it's, it's, an interesting yeah, it's important it's important that what you're doing is for is for everyone you know and um and that you're writing what you're from your own experiences and and um, with people you're close with and and can represent um, and that's um, why I felt so comfortable writing that because them old fellows were with me all the way and and um, and you know and also talking with the families you know that were in still going you know because old fellows have passed you know so we're working with the families and. They were so proud and to see that um, all those years of um, what we went through was able to be written written down and and I yeah and I guess the IP of um, you know of um, fire country or of the knowledge in general and you know 
of course, that's also why I wrote the book was to protect that that knowledge and to to put it out there so that it couldn't be um, bastardized or turned around, and which can easily quite be done by a lot of people who see opportunities from that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Wow. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Pub? I'm interested in the publishing process. Did Hardy Grant approach you? Were you looking? So you said you weren't looking to write a book. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was, well, when those fires went off and in 2019, um, I got a phone call from Hardy Grant, from Melissa. And um, she said, oh, hello. Um, you know, we just... Um, Think it's a good idea if you would write a book about fire because of um, what's happening in the world right now <laughs> and it was just happened that i was already oh. writing three years prior to that so i started writing fire uh fire country three years before then and and it was um i was doing it without any publisher or without any way or any idea how to how, how you would ever get a book out there. I got no idea, had no idea. And so I was just writing it because I knew that I wanted to write it down. And so that's what I was doing. And it took me three years because I was always working and on and off and writing it on planes and writing in hotel rooms and you couldn't write it at home too much and there's too much distractions and, you know, and you're always working. So it was all broken up into finding the time when I could put, um, you know, and I could actually write stuff down. So um, I found myself just doing that in aeroplanes and hotel rooms most of the time and being out on country on trips and having those nights where I had no one around and sit down and write stuff. And, um, yeah, and that was, um, that was um, what I was doing prior. And then when she asked me, you want to write a book? I said, well, I've already been writing for three years almost and I've got all the stuff, um, but I'm not finished, I said. I've still got a lot to put down. And so there was a little bit of like, ah, oh, but we want you to put something out now. And then there was like a bit of a rush, rush, push, push. And not that that's nothing against the publishers. It was something that, you know, they see fitting and they want to push things in the right timing. Um, so I just went, went with that and I said, well, okay. So I closed off. So there was more work to do and I didn't write everything in there. And, um, there's heaps more to go. And so I'm hoping that soon, which I can't really say, but I'm just hoping that I'm able to um, to actually write another edition or um, or expand on the current um, book and add another four or five chapters to it uh, or more. And also talk about the global experience that I've had with fire in Canada and other places and and bring that global influence in there as well. And my experiences over there, and there's such a fascinating stories that come out of that one. And so, yeah, I'm hoping that I can finish the job um, and actually make it to what I really, really wanted the book to be. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, those but Americans. They change. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's been interesting seeing some of the, the American stuff as well and the hot shots mm. and I'll just drop teams in and, 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 and it's really weird when you look at some of those old pictures and some of those old forests weren't that densely populated. So, of course, you've got so much more fuel than you ever had before. You've got this yeah. warming conditions. How did you find working with people that sort of do things a little differently than, than we do in Australia? Well, it wasn't really much different at all. And no. when we look at overseas and when we look at fire, in other countries and just the natural environment, it's all made up the same way, you know, it all had fire as part of its evolution, you know, and, and it's all been a part of the picture and um, from traditional owners too and Aboriginal pe peoples in other countries, they also use the fire the same way and, and with um, very, very similar um, outcomes and indicators and, you know, the reason in general. And not only is it, like the same there's a lot of similarities around that with the culturally and environmentally but also with the way that the government's um the way the government deal with deals with it the way that uh, aboriginal people are uh, treated the way the same social problems um the same um society 
sort of structures that get in the way of positive change uh, around, you know, everything. And when I went to Canada, it was like, um, it was like going in a time machine. It was like heading there, you know, three years ago, it was like, um, was like stepping back 20 years in Australia. And, you know, it was like all of a sudden I was in a place, like I went in and I knocked on the, you know, got into the community and talked to the Tulish learners. And, and I was, first thing I said, well, what do you, you know, we're here to talk about fire. What do you know about fire? And, um, oh, yeah, we know about fire. And then they took me to the fire shed and opened the door and showed me all these backpacks, you know, water backpack for fighting fire and told me about that. Chop the trees, thin all the trees out with axes, and and I said, "That's Western management." And they go, "Yeah, yeah, we do it." You know, that's the way they taught us. And I said, "No, I'm talking about that really old stuff. I'm talking about that that traditional knowledge on fire, how your old people manage the land with fire." And so a lot of them was like, "Oh, you know, we've lost a lot of that information, and it's not as much as it should be." Just like in Australia, you know, like. Some places had some knowledge, some places didn't have much, and it was all a mixture. And um, and and then when I looked at the general public, they haven't even heard of the traditional burning that much there. And, and so it was like re-educating the public, it's getting the governments engaged, and it was like starting all over again. And then not only starting all over again in, in that sense, but also starting all over again to learn all the trees and learn all the vegetation. And so I was like starting all over again that way too. So I would walk around with them old fellas and going, oh, what's that tree? And what's that tree? And what's its name? And what's its values? How, you know, we use them for. And I had to relearn a lot of their trees. And that was this, like the process then of going, wow, and be able to link up similarities um, at home. And so I found trees that were the same. Different, of course, but, you know, I found the bloodwood tree, like the relation over there. And I found the iron bark tree relation in Canada. And I found the red, red gum tree relations and similar soils and grasses and the same cultural values in terms of what they do in those ecosystems. Very similar. And it was just blew me away. And, um, so I was getting all excited and they were looking at me, why are you getting excited? And I said, oh, if only you knew, I could take you back over to our way and show you those connections. And so it was a really amazing experience and there's more work to do over there and, um, and hopefully um, in other places as well to really demonstrate on a global scale um, you know, those similarities and that, that underpins us all as in humanity. And I guess um, that's something that um, that's really important for the whole world, really, not just for us in Australia. And um, I guess you just have to wait for me to write the next bits, but I won't let too much out. <laughs> a teaser. Keep us yeah, that's a small, <laughs> yeah, small teaser, yeah. No, I'm yeah. glad there's more to come. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Yeah, there is more to come. And I can't exactly say what it is exactly, but it's we're working on it. Yeah. Oh, Southern De Leon season something. Yeah, get you back. <laughs> you back yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll certainly feel better about finishing the book the way I really wanted to finish it. Yeah. Well, well sometimes I guess you just got to wait for those stars to align. And yeah. At least you had like mm. a manuscript or transcript halfway done. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's been great. I mean, what it's, you know, it's what, what the book has done so far has just been incredible. You know, uh, you know, I get old people ringing up like, Oh, white fellows ringing up, you know? And so I had to take my phone number off the internet and take all my contacts and pull them all down because I was just getting flooded. You know, I'd be home there and that phone would ring. And ring again and then ring, ring. I said, gee, where's the one I smash his phone? <laughs> and then I just like get onto the phone and I answer it. And it's like Sunday morning, you know, early morning or Saturday morning. I'm like, who's ringing me now? <laughs> and then I get on there and I answer that phone. And, and it's, you know, really beautiful old, old man, you know, like 80 years of age, you know, 
oh, I just want to ring and tell you that, you know, keep on going, keep doing the work. It's just so right to, you know, look after the land that way. And we remember when we were kids that we used to see fires and, and these really lovely, lovely souls, you know, old souls would get in contact with me and I'd have this conversation for like for half an hour to an hour with them. And then you realize you can't just keep doing that. I'm talking to everyone, talking to everyone and having a phone in your ear and, and um, not having time for yourself and, and having a break from all that stuff. So, you know, just so well received. And some people were, you know, just um, were giving the book out to governments and, Ooh. you know, and seeing that as a really opportunity to try and influence people and, uh, you know, so it, it, it's a good thing. And uh, and especially for youth, you know, a lot of youth got in touch. And I feel, you know, if, if any of the youth are listening out there that ever did get in touch with me and send an email, I just want to say apologize and know that, yeah, I just couldn't can't keep up with it, you know, and it's just impossible to answer everyone. But it was such a good thing to, um, for like everyone to have something to actually inform them a little bit more than what was already happening, you know, on television, you know, like the documentaries of fire they put on there, it's just so Western based and they aren't hopeful. It's all about fear. It's all about the destruction all about the death and the loss and um, you know and so I really wanted to put something out there that was about hope and beauty and um, that um, it's not just doom and gloom you know yeah lovely no, that's awesome and thanks for making the time tonight I mean we have noticed you're in your car and, and you yeah. said, but you're in the Hunter Valley <laughs> heading somewhere I'm heading up to Hunter Valley now, and where you're, you're from, I think. And yeah, I was born in Maitland. Yeah, just with up a, the road um, from Cessna. Yeah, Bonanora people and all them different clan groups up there. And there's a collective of clan groups up up there that are young people and 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 middle aged that are doing the um, a trainee course, uh, one of our first three year courses. Yeah, and it's the first one off the ranks that's um, being supported with um, local land services and um, and that's based on the three-year concept of um, learning and teaching um, you know this this way of reading landscapes and applying fire and, and helping communities to rebuild that, that knowledge back on their country and help them support them to do it to do it and and they just love it you know it's just like they're just so eager to get out there and and then you know you get them to do the work and then and they're like and you know like the, the white fellas they come to who witness it and they see the the younger people just out there working so hard and they're like gee gee they're going for look at them they're just so passionate i say yeah that's right it's not about you know lazy black fella it's about the the right um job and the purpose and and you know you're not going to get uh, get the people to go out there and dig holes in the ground to, for the mining and the gold, dig the gold out of the ground, but you'll certainly get them enthusiastic about managing their land through their culture and finding their identity. And if they can have uh, have uh, that job that way or that work that way on their own landscapes, that's, that's, what, that's what's needed. And that's what aligns with what the old people feel is good for the youth. And that is to you know, they'll get lost if they don't connect with that landscape and if they're not working on the land. And and it's it's an aspiration that has always been on the forefront of all of the vision is that really simply the, the main aspiration is get those young people on country learning about their culture and about their knowledge. And, um, and the rest will follow. And um, I guess that's a really simple um, way of putting it and a simple goal. The next step from this, of course, is to is to get the governments and agencies to see that same value, and I think that's the biggest challenge, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but here I am in my car. Well, not my car. It's a rental <laughs> car. But um, I'm heading up. I'm about two more hours drive yet, so I'll get to the where I'm going. And the good news is that that don't get out on that don't start till ten o'clock tomorrow, so I can have a bit of a sleep in. <laughs> yeah. uh, I love that you know reading country 
you know, getting people involved with learning in sort of different ways, you know, different ways of perspective, different ways of learning. I often tend to think, you know, just sitting down reading books, you know, I failed English class quite a few times too. It's just one of those yeah. things I didn't quite click in my mind. Yeah, yeah. And it's like some other mob too, you know, like some good brothers and other mobs that will they say, I've never read a book in my life, but I read your book. <laughs> and they're sort of like the same way. And I could really understand it. And I could actually read your book, they say, yeah, because I enjoyed it. And and it was the first book I read ever read, and some would say, and it's the fastest book, fastest I've ever read a book too, because I just kept reading. And um, and that was really nice to, to see people who, who've never really read a book, you know, um, say that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we can have Eve tell us about how great books are as well, I suppose. Well, I'd be biased because yeah. I am a librarian. But, you know, no wrong way to read. No, it's never too late to start reading. There's audiobooks and, yeah, a book for every reader is what they say. Mm. Um, and you're obviously feeling that need, Victor, which is excellent. Yeah, yeah. Unless you're like me, you need picture book. We've got, we've got them too. The library's got picture books, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, we are working on a children's book at the moment. And <laughs> what? Nice. Yeah, and um, it's called Looking After Country with Fire. And um, it's really, is really a beautiful little story. And it's a, about a character called Uncle Ku, um, which I um, made the features of the character based on my uncle my uncle Russell and um, just to make it a bit more personal and um, yeah so hopefully that'll come out soon and there's a little song that's written on the back of that book as well and and so we'll record the song and put it out there as well and um, you know it's all about having fun you know and it's all about enjoying yourself and because that's what happens when people come with me on the land and when we're teaching and when we're doing burns everyone's enjoying themselves and Everyone has an amazing experience. And again, that's the differences. You know, when you go to the Western Burns, they're all freaking out. And you got to have the certain clothes on. And, you know, and if you're not fire trained and you're not out on the fire ground and, and um, you know, there's sirens and there's lights flashing and there's everyone on standby expecting something to go wrong. But yeah. when they're out on country doing this way that everyone's just relaxed and enjoys themselves and have fun and and um and just has a really beautiful experience you know and that's what life should be you know and especially when we're dealing with our planet and dealing with our country it should be an amazing experience every time we set foot on our land you know in the, in the landscape and because it's just so beautiful and when you're a part of that you know, it's um, even more special. And um, and so that's why, you know, I just want to get away from all the bureaucracy and get away from the, the negativity and just focus on on having fun. And, um, and that's how we've gotten to this point is just the whole, all these years, is just, just get out there and just do it and just enjoy it. Yeah. They sound like words to live by. Yeah, yeah, we've had a creative destructor on just recently. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, we need more disruptors. Disruptors. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> and yeah, that the, and when you were yeah. explaining it then about the loving it and being a part of it, I mean, I remember responding priority one to fires, you're banging down roads, you, and then you get to the fire and it's just wait, you know, and you're just like, oh, there goes all the adrenaline out of the system. And yeah, and when the fire does come, all these big over, you know, helicopters buzzing from over here, you got planes coming through. It's, it's almost like it's some sort of war zone, whereas I, I like the sound of your fires a whole lot better. Yeah, yeah. And it's always like that, you know. It's always um, a peaceful experience and simply because, um, you know, you you got that confidence from understanding country and having that knowledge to back you up is just so important. And that's the safest thing you can ever have. It's not the trucks and it's not the emergency equipment and, you know, the triple zero. The safest thing you can have is knowledge. And and that's why uh, old people could burn so 
beautifully and look after the land and it's just all based on knowledge and um, if you got that knowledge then you'll always be safe and you'll always know what to expect uh, when you're lighting that fire and that's the confidence that all practitioners need and the confidence that the entire nation needs in terms of understanding it and and but we've you know we've it's all started you know at least it's begun and you know because i was looking at the one fire the other week last week and i looking at this little three-year-old boy was standing there watching the fire you know and he with his mom and um you know they were non-indigenous you know it was an aboriginal event and everyone was there traditional owners and of course you know non-indigenous people attend these things too you know and so they're there standing there and the little three-year-olds watching the fire and watching people on the land just tendering the land and walking with the fire and and just enjoying themselves and picking up plants and sticks and, and examining things and, and so i looked at the mother and I look at that little one and i say see that's that's how the next generations have got to come into this world they've got to come into the world and see people engaging with the land this way and and working with fire this way and and not coming into the world, looking at the television and seeing destruction. So that's a big, big thing. Being born at this time and era in 2021 into the world and, and to be able to see Aboriginal people managing the land with fire again, that's something that's been missing for over 100 years in some places and 50 years or more in others. And, and that's um, why we're in this dilemma. So, you know, it's all begun. The healing's begun. And this is the turning point, you know, where um, people are, you know, going to be more aware because they're going to be born into something that, they, um, that they're witnessing straight away. And so that's why we've got to keep going and um, keep, um, keep up that work and in that positive way. Yeah. Mm. And you mentioned that um, the burns can be a really peaceful experience. And Elijah and I were both lucky enough to attend one of your burns. I don't know if that's the one you were talking about a moment ago here in Adelaide on Ghana land recently. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was just incredible. And you're right. Everybody was so like having fun. Yeah. Little, and, yeah. It was amazing to see. Is that, is that often the case? Yeah. And you were there, right? Yeah. Yeah. You see that little girl rubbing ash all over her face yeah <laughs> and playing in all the ash straight after the fire passed over and um it was just um it was just really lovely you know and everyone was just you can see people when i lit the fire people were like whoa you know this is um I, I, you know i wonder what's going to happen here you know <laughs> they was all expecting something to go wrong but then soon it wasn't soon long after with the commentary and you know explaining things and when they started to see what was going on they yeah they get to experience that in the city and that was an amazing thing because i've never burned in a city where you're surrounded by buildings you know the hospital was just across the road and they were freaking out too because they were going like oh we hope we don't get smoke coming through our air conditioners and into our patients and uh, so that's not going to happen so people were really, uh, you know, really um, worried as well. But that was the first time ever to have a burn in the city. And so I was really proud to be able to do that with um, all the Ghana mob there and traditional owners in that region. And it was so good to see so many traditional owners turn up. Um, of course, not all of them would have been there, but it would have been, um, but still it was a good representation, you know. And um, that's really important that, People in the cities are getting the opportunity to um, share in that experience and, um, and be able to see something like that. Um, and, you know, I was watching a lot of the adults walking around just so surreal, you know, they were just like, I can't believe this is happening. And just, look at the fire. Look at it. Look at it. <laughs> it's just so low. It's just doing what it, it what was said it was going to do. And, and that's, that's what we need to be doing. We need to be bringing those experiences into the cities as well as in the country. And that knowledge and understanding of landscapes need to be shared with everyone because uh, it's so important that everyone has a little bit of that experience because 
Um, it just um, it shows again, like I said before, it gives them the big picture and it allows them to be more supportive for change. And it also allows them to um, see how they can contribute. Like, you know, like the cities, in the cities, you know, it could be a teacher at that burn that's going to go and teach, show that in a school and show the kids the video or, or there might be a law, a law student at that burn in Adelaide and, and studying law and thinking, oh, well, I'm going to really try and work for looking after the land with law. Or it could have been someone who's an architect and was really interested in better designs and houses from around understanding the land better through this. And it's, the applications are endless in terms of um, how traditional knowledge and natural law will never go out of date um, when it comes to uh, um, how it's applicable to our everyday lives. So it doesn't matter what people think where, oh, it's a different world now or it's, it's, you know, natural law and, and the values, those values of that Indigenous knowledge systems have gathered over thousands of years will never go out of date. And um, they'll always sh shine a light on, uh, you know, on us, you know, furthermore into the future. Yeah, they're almost like the laws of physics, some of these old laws. They yeah. just to be timeless. And I guess there'll always be people that try to dispute them, but yeah, they're going mm -hmm. to be on the wrong side of history. Yeah, that's another reason why, you know, writing the book too, you know, because I was tired of listening to people just, just say things that are just so just uninspiring <laughs> and telling children that there's nothing you can do about it. It's climate change, and, uh, you know, and there's, um, there's nothing we can do. It's a different world now. Aboriginal knowledge doesn't apply anymore. And I just kept hearing things like that. And it's like, uh, you know, it's just rubbish. You know, um, those comments are coming from, coming from a place where um, it, it hasn't had that experience or understanding at all of um, what we're talking about. And that's um, the same right now, you know, like all the accusations around fire, and involving indigenous knowledge they're all guesses um because they haven't they don't understand indigenous knowledge they don't understand how Aboriginal people burnt country they don't see all the different layers of soils and trees and ecosystems and they don't know that style of burning and, and that understanding of the land and so that's why we need to get out there and demonstrate it and over the years demonstrating that knowledge has just uh, change a lot of perceptions. Yeah, yeah. And the latest one I've heard was, "Oh, it's too expensive to do cultural burning across the country. Too expensive." <laughs> uh, meanwhile, they, they meanwhile billions of dollars go down the drain every time they have a wildfire, and um, billions of dollars are gone into fighting fires, but yet zero. Zero dollars are gone into investing in a healthy landscape and and um, and a more intelligent human race. <laughs> more intelligent. It's ludicrous. Human. It really is ludicrous. And and yeah, even those better connections of yeah. you know, I, I think through some of your work, you hopefully breaking down those barriers because we tend to have some pretty big power structures around that almost seem immune to change, and they'll just keep thinking, oh, we'll just do it the same old, same old, and something going to be different it just oh well you know better. you know whatever's good for their life at the at, at the time being whatever you know feathers their nest in this day and age it's not going to be the same for the next generation and that's why we can't allow um you know to have these old mindsets to just continue to rip everything off and and to just be in charge and and um or, or because they, they're sitting on a good good wicket, you know what I mean? And I'm sure everyone understands what I'm saying there. You know, it's, you know, there's a lot of money made out of fear. Yeah, yeah, and the destruction. More money in fear than, than, than hope, I can tell you that. And that's, well, that's what they think. And so they're so comfortable making so much money out of chemicals to poison the weeds and like making the next fireproof guttering for the houses and putting bunkers in your backyard or 
they're making so much money out of building the firefighting equipment. But when you talk about looking after the land the right way, oh, no, we can't do that. It's not good for my business. <laughs> Yeah, and that's yeah. why, that's why you know I write that story that in fire country you know that experiences I've had around the you know leading conferences you know international, it's all dominated by um, the fear, and um, and there's a good reason for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and there tends to be this colonial uh, hangover of, you know, you've got to master it, you've got to command it. And, Rather than work with it and be a part of it, it's just like no, 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 no. We're separate. We're apart from it. And we're going to manage it the way you know we've been doing all this time. And and sometimes you get to these places and you just you just feel a part of them. You're almost embraced. You're almost consumed by the land because it's just so beautiful. And you can't see why people would want to be I don't know wanting to control and rip it all apart sometimes. That's right. It's um, it's just the way it is, you know, and um, and you know, we're going to continue to deal with that, and we're going to continue to deal with greed as well, even with the solutions. You know, people see now the the fire, indigenous fire, indigenous fire, and so now people see money, opportunities for money, you know, and um, and I see that starting to happen now with the rising, you know, since those wildfires, I see greed, and and I just. So we're going to be dealing with that. It's a sickness, and it's a sickness that's right across right that we within a whole society. It's it's you know having that, the right reasons of doing things is not about money. It's about our future generations. It's about who we are. It's about our, you know looking after our country. They're the first real values, you know. And um, so you know it's going to be forever. Uh, the evil of the world is, you know, that money system and money has, is the reason why we're in this situation and, uh, and we're going to have to deal with that into the future. And, um, but that's something that, you know, I feel that we can get over, you know, if we can just keep on doing the right thing. Well, it's, yeah, I'd, I'd love the way that you mentioned earlier about, you know, what would some of the pioneers think if they knew where Australia was heading, you know, 150 years ago, I could see it now. Yeah. You know, we are sort of trying to turn things around. Is, is there a vision on the horizon that you see coming in the next few generations? Well, yeah, I think what I really see, if we... I continue to go on this right road, you know, in terms of that awareness that's happening right now. And, you know, um, people are really shifting towards looking after the land and fire. Like I said, like I always say, it's just the beginning, you know, there's going to be so much more that will come from this in terms of, you know, changing the, who we are and taking us to the next level, you know, as humans, you know, in this planet. It's, um, you know, I can just only see the truth being revealed, you know, as time goes on. And um, and the more we connect with the land, the more that the um, the rubbish is revealed, the, and the more that we see the truth and um, understand that the way that we were, and I mean, we're going to be looking back in generations' time thinking, what were we thinking back then? What were our grandfathers thinking? What in the hell were they doing? I mean, we think that now, you know, like, why were they giving me cod liver oil when I was a kid? <laughs> you know? And you think, why did, what was it? What was that? You know, I don't need that. <laughs> well, it's just the same, you know, like, you know, we're going to be looking back, you know, we'll be gone, but the next generations, they're going to be, hopefully what I'm hoping that they're going to be saying, I'm glad that they woke up. And I think that's the that's the that's the the ray of hope, and I think um, that's something that I that I really see happening in the future, and it can only come from the good work. And um, but most importantly, it can only come from everyone working together and um, seeing past their own personal interests and opinions. Yeah. Oh, that's you know, beautiful. Can, it's all inevitable, you know. 
it's definitely inevitable. You can't, we've got no choice but to um, steer the ship in the right directions. And, you know, we can see the storm. We just need to turn in another direction where we see blue sky. <laughs> yeah. Yes, no, I do like that. And we, we do tend to change things a little bit as well. I mean, nationally, you know, there's national parks done by federal state jurisdictions. We've now had indigenous protected areas in for about 20 years now, and they're starting to becoming more and more um, important as time goes on. How, how do you deal with some of these other bureaucracies and structures? And, and do you like working with one more than others or they both or all come with different challenges? Well, the best way is to not deal with it. <laughs> nah. Well, you know, I mean, I I've, I've think, you know, I think it's a mixed, a mixed thing for me. I mean, depends where I am, where I go, but generally across the board, I see improvement in the way that uh, governments operate. And I do see a, a greater improvement in the general society. You know, just for your, for your everyday people, white fellows, black fellows, whatever, you know. So, I, you know, I see great improvement on, for everyone on, that, on the ground level over the time. But government, we've still got a long way to go. Um, and, you know, we do have a long way to go right across the board, you know. Um, so, yeah, there is, things are changing. And I think a lot of people would agree with that. But I'm not going to say that that's it and that it's all rosy. Um, we've still got a hell of a long way to go because it'll just, yeah, just, you know, when those fires went off, I was like, oh, you know, I, you know, it was devastating. And, but the response, I thought to myself, oh, well, this is it. You know, it's going to happen. We're going to, they're going to do training models. We're going to get out there. We're going to start the whole process. We're going to, they're going to see fire in the landscape like they've never seen it before. And uh, everyone's going to have, um, Everyone, it's just going to be so exciting, but that never happened. It, um, we're still pushing on our own, and um, millions and millions of dollars of funding, you know, that went into um, that fire campaigns, and nothing, you know, very little, nothing went to Aboriginal people, you know, except for maybe. A, uh, you know, one percent from what the government threw, like a bone. You know, it's we've got a long way to go, and um, they, ha from what I see, they haven't listened from those wildfires. Um, in in a sense of the hierarchy of this country, and they think they're listening, and they they contact me and say, yeah, we're listening, and and um, and then they ask me to come and do a royal commission and. Do an, an inquiry in this state and another inquiry in another state, and going into the courtroom and giving evidence, and you think, "Oh wow, this is great," but you know, here we are, still same old, same old. You know, just working with what we can with the communities, and um, and we're going that whole next level. We got this training model up and running. I'm just about to go to now, and the three-year training model, we're on that next level, <laughs> but the, but not with any government funding from this country. <laughs> it's just a shame, you know? And really, it's an embarrassment. And, you know, and this is recorded and live and going out there, and, you know, and I really have no trouble saying that it's, it's a real embarrassment um, that we're not, we haven't seen some real tangible action taken around... Um, getting um, the right process happening and dealing with these, this, um, this crisis that, that we have with managing our landscapes. So, um, but yeah, it's not all doom and gloom, like I always say, you know, but, you know, we can't not avoid um, being truthful about the challenges ahead and, and where we're at at this point in time. Yeah. Wow, Victor, I think that might be a poignant note to leave things on. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming to Adelaide. Thanks for signing our book. We've got a the, signed library ah, right. <laughs> for the young yes, people yes. for the good fire. I remember that. And um, yeah, just a message to the Adelaide 
it was such a wonderful day that day out there on the park there and doing that burn and with the mob there and it was such an emotional time for a lot of the traditional owners and you know even the mayor of the city you know i mean what a champion she's amazing mm. and um you know i just want to say thank you to adelaide and i know that this wasn't for me it was for you and but i just want to say thank you because it's just beautiful to be a part of that um with you all and and to see it so well received so Oh, well, well, thank you Beautiful. for being that bit of tide of change that keeps lapping at the shores and will hopefully, you know, break that threshold and yeah. permeate through. So, yeah, keep up the good work. And I love thank the idea you. of another book coming out. Yes, we can't wait. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> we might have to get you All in right. the library for that one. Yeah, and so, yeah, so it's like eight, nearly nine o'clock here. Oh, what is it? Eight o'clock now. Oh, I still got a little bit of time to find something to eat that's decent, that isn't some sort of takeaway food. Otherwise, I'll have to starve. But, um, oh, but anyway, I got a, I got a little way to go. But um, it's just been um really honour to to talk with you tonight. So thanks, thanks for you for the opportunity. Thanks, Victor. Thank you so much. Yeah, stay Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye now. Now, just for our audience still hanging out, we'll just say thank you so much for joining us. Um, we'll have the video and the podcast of this yarn up online at onkaringacity.com um, sometime this week. Um, you'll also get a feedback email, so we rely really heavily on your feedback to keep continuing um, to deliver programs like Southern Deadly Yarns. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Bye.